Hi everybody, and welcome to our second webinar on this National Biomechanics Day. And before we get into, well, everything that we want to talk to you about, we are going to take a moment and let Paul DeVita tell you what National Biomechanics Day is all about. Hello and welcome to National Biomechanics Day, the worldwide celebration of biomechanics. My name is Paul DeVita and I am the founder and director of National Biomechanics Day. We started NBD as we call it in 2016 with 50 labs across the United States showing and introducing biomechanics to over 2,000 high school students. And that opened the floodgates in 2017 and 18 to many countries joining National Biomechanics Day. Canada, Hong Kong, Malaysia and Singapore, Brazil, Portugal, Czech Republic, and others all wanted to have NBD events in their own countries. They wanted to introduce biomechanics to their high school students. And so in these five years, we've had 30 nations participate in National Biomechanics Day. National Biomechanics Day is international. Here are photographs of NBD events around the world the past several years. In fact, in these five years, we have had nearly 30,000 high school students participate in NBD events around the world. We introduced biomechanics to high school students to increase the impact, the influence, the beneficial outcomes of biomechanics on human society. While biomechanics covers all forms of life, most NBD events are about humans and human movement. Here we have musculoskeletal modeling of a runner and a baseball player. We have an exoskeleton designed to help people walk. In the top right, we have isokinetic muscle testing to test muscle strength. And we do it all with a smile. Some NBDs might show animal biomechanics though, and for example, show canine locomotion. Or perhaps it's plant biomechanics, <laughs> watch out fly, or dinosaur biomechanics, or how about superhero biomechanics? Well, maybe not superhero biomechanics, but I'll bet they have some good biomechanics. We have two main expressions in National Biomechanics Day. The first, science meets fun on NBD, because it shows biomechanics of fun activities. And the second is we are celebrating the 21st century's breakthrough science. Biomechanics will break through in a big way in the next 10 and 20 years. Why? Because biomechanics helps people. One might ask, why National Biomechanics Day? Because NBD provides a platform upon which we unite into one synchronized worldwide celebration of biomechanics. Biomechanics, the perfect STEM field containing science, technology, engineering, and mathematics. And we do it with a smile. Thank you very much. Have a great day. So we are going to pick up right where uh, Paul left off as uh, my experience in biomechanics unfortunately did not start until I was already in college. In fact, I didn't know what biomechanics was until almost the end of my time in college. But before I talk about that, I love this picture. Uh, my, well, at the time, she was about five-year-old uh, daughter, drew this. Now, she's actually in high school as well. And she understood biomechanics better than most people I know today. As I guess I talk about biomechanics a lot, and you see in the first picture, she drew a skeleton. Now, the skeleton is one of the things that I had explained to her we can measure in its motion, or sort of, but we have a pretty good idea of how the skeleton is moving. 
And then in the second picture here, see these are muscles that are on top of the skeleton. Together, they make the musculoskeletal system. And in fact, to be precise, I am really in a field called musculoskeletal biomechanics. Now, the muscles can also be measured in how they are making us move. Now, the last picture here, this is my daughter as uh, once we know how the skeleton and the muscles are moving, we can understand how she is moving. Which I think is a pretty good way of understanding what we do in biomechanics. Now, back before I knew what biomechanics was, I was in my uh, next to last year of college and a buddy of mine and I were handed a box, much like this one, that our professor said, put it up. We didn't know what it was, and we had no idea why it would have to go up. As it turns out, inside this mysterious box was a motion capture system. Now, many of you probably have heard of motion capture by now, because it's been used to make many, many movies and video games uh, for probably the last 20 years. Before that, it was not very well known. But at the time, we didn't know at all what we were doing. And in fact, it took us a long time to put it up. But once it was up, we started learning how to use it. Now, this particular system was uh, what we would consider more of a traditional motion capture system as it would follow the motion of markers like these. Now, these markers are on a cluster, so you can put it like on your arm, and as it moves, the cameras will see the motion of these markers, and therefore, we can have a pretty good estimate of where the arm is moving as long as it's attached. Now, stuff like this, uh, you can do a lot with, and usually you use straps or tape. We didn't know that at the time. In fact, uh, here's me. I always got to be the first one tested as I was one of the most junior on the group. And we didn't use tape, we used rubber bands because somehow we thought that would hurt me less. We were very wrong. But this was one of our example setups. And you can see here, uh, obviously under my chin, it bothered me a lot, so bubble wrap seemed to be a good option. But I do wanna point out, you see this camera here? This camera, is uh, had these red LEDs that shine uh, would shine light, and it reflects off of markers like these, and then the camera would pick it up. Today, the systems use infrared, and they are uh, very accurate, and we get very good data from them. But the technology until very recently hadn't really changed. Now, getting a little ahead of myself there, we use these cameras to measure how people would uh, change direction or uh, walk in our lab so that then we could move a cadaver. Now, we actually hooked up this machine to a robot to move it. Now. We know that muscles are involved in motion, so we also applied muscle forces. So essentially, we put the cadaver femur into this contraption, and we would line it up so that the axis of rotation would match up with this axis that we had built, and we applied the muscle forces using these pneumatic cylinders. Now, to give you a good idea of what it looked like, well, ta-da! Hopefully you've already had your breakfast and lunch, and maybe you'll skip supper, but 
it was very interesting. And one of the interesting reasons that we did this was because unlike most people that would come into our lab, the cadaver did not protest when we asked if we could cut the ACL. So we ran these tests and we cut the ACL and then we ran them again to compare the differences. So that was interesting research and motion capture was a key part of that because we were using actual human motion to move the robot then, which you can see here. Now we had to slow it down and there were some problems. It was a long time ago and uh, we were undergrads, but we were pretty proud of what we were accomplishing. After that, I uh, went through grad school and then I ended up working in a clinic because I realized that biomechanics was a great way that I could help people. And I really wanted to do something that helped people. I had worked for other companies that had nothing to do with biomechanics. Uh, for example, even on rockets, super fun, very fun to play with explosives, but I really liked doing something that would help people. And in this clinic, we had two types of patients, usually uh, older people that had orthopedic problems, or as you can see uh, from the jerseys on the back and the walls, soccer players. We had some of the highest level soccer players in all of Italy coming into the lab. And in fact, in this next video, I can't tell you who this is, but if you could see the entire video, you would probably recognize him. He was one of the top players in Italy. Of course, it was quite a while ago, and we were testing him as he was recovering after an injury. Now, what you can see is, yes, we have these markers, and we have what looks like a tail. Now, back then, to measure the muscle activations, we had to have a cable connected. Today, these systems are wireless, much more convenient. But between all of the markers and these extra cables, we were adding a lot onto our subjects and our patients. So, if you think about it, when people maybe put a bunch of straps on you, and then tell you walk naturally, you probably know you're not going to walk very naturally because, well, you have all of this other stuff going on and that affects you, which is why we are talking about this today because there's new technology available that just a few years ago, I didn't believe would ever be possible, but incredibly, we have gotten to the point where we can perform markerless motion capture. That means we don't need these markers anymore. We can, or not for certain types of uh, data collections, we can actually collect data with no markers at all. The reason this is very interesting, well, there are many reasons actually that this is very interesting, but uh, for example, if a patient comes into a hospital and maybe they have some kind of neurological disorder that doesn't allow them to be out very much, they get tired very easily, which unfortunately is a fairly common situation. When we ask them to stand to put all the markers on, I mean, 10, 15 minutes to put all of these markers on is actually pretty fast. It's usually more than that. So, if we can take that out, we can actually be analyzing these patients a lot faster. And well, maybe we're actually analyzing them for the first time because otherwise they would have gotten too tired. So that's a simple example. Or we could also get into sports more as we don't have to have the players wear all of this extra equipment, they can actually perform their sport in their natural environment with no extra devices on so that we can measure what's actually happening. And the way this is done is there's this company called Thea that actually has developed software to 
look at individual pictures to estimate where each joint center is, or actually more than just joint centers, but they're interesting points on the human body. The way they've done this actually is by having mostly students go through image by image and say, I think this point right here is a shoulder and this is an elbow. But they didn't do this two, three, four times, a hundred times. They've done this on about 500,000 images and counting. And they give the results of all of this human labor to a computer and say, okay, here's where joint centers are. Now from 500,000, that's a lot of information. It tells a computer, if you see a new image that we've never told you about, you can guess where a joint center is based on these 500,000 other images. So when Fia goes through these videos, it goes image by image and figures this out, giving us a very surprisingly reliable system of markerless motion capture. Now, that might have sounded a little bit technical, so let's actually look at an example. Since this is National Biomechanics Day, and I have one daughter who's in high school and one who will start high school the next fall, they get to be our examples. Here we have FIA. This is the actual program I was telling you about. Now, the first thing that it does when it's running through is it creates these boxes. You can maybe see around each of these. Let me double click. You see we have a blue box and an orange box. The blue box is around the blue skeleton and the orange box is around the orange skeleton. These boxes essentially are saying this is a human and this is a human. Now at the time there's no skeleton there. And then Thea looks inside the boxes to find those interesting points on the human to identify what is maybe a joint center, what might be uh, the neck or some part of the hand, a detail on the foot that we can actually focus on. So with this information, we go image by image for each camera to identify it. And then it's all put together. See here we have eight cameras and it's all put together into this 3D view. So when we click play, you can see the skeletons are moving around and here my daughters actually spin around and do just some simple motion. But the very interesting thing here is that putting it all together, we were able to create this 3D tracking with no markers at all. Now, you say, well, that wasn't all that interesting emotion. Why would anybody have to analyze that? And that is a fair point. So let's look at an example of walking. Which walking is usually referred to as gait by biomechanists. And it is probably the most commonly analyzed motion we have. So here you see, actually both of my daughters are walking in this example, but right now you only see one. Now she's a little too far back for the cameras to be able to create that 3D reconstruction of her. But you'll see as she walks into the picture, it's going to identify her. And then when it sees my other daughter, it's going to identify her as well. So you see here it's a little far back and uh, it has trouble, but they're very good tracking and ta-da! Now we have two skeletons walking here through our attic. 
So having them walk that close is also a very interesting thing because one of the downsides of having to use markers is that the camera has to see the marker, which if you have this cluster on your arm like this, as long as it's facing up and the cameras are up in the ceiling, no big deal. But as soon as I turn it down, the cameras are going to have trouble tracking it, which is interestingly not as much of a problem for markerless tracking as from those 500,000 images, the students identified that this is a wrist and this is a wrist. So it can track the wrist no matter which way it's facing, which gives us a lot of flexibility and reduces the number of cameras we have uh, that we need. So actually, if we have in this case, eight cameras, we are able to track two people in our very small attic. And if we were using traditional motion capture, we would probably need 12, if not 16, to track the same motion. Now, since I already started talking about walking and we already talked about how getting in the way could create problems, I wanted to test Thea even more. So we have another walking example that actually is even more difficult to uh, have the good tracking for both people. As you see, they're crossing in front of each other. And as long as they're in the middle, so in the view of most of the cameras, it does a very good job in tracking. Now, you say, okay, walking. How interesting is that? Well, this is an actual medical-like report. Although this wasn't used for medical purposes, it was used for testing purposes. But again, this is done right here in our mocap attic. This is one of my daughters again, who recorded here in our attic See, this is one of my daughters again. And just walking through the attic, we're able to collect medically relevant data. Although this was just done for testing purposes, you can see we have hip, knee, and ankle joint angles along with foot angles. This is very interesting information to physical therapists and orthopedic surgeons as they try to help their patients. Now, biomechanics goes beyond medicine. <laughs> but this is one of the great ways that I love to help biomechanics labs help people. Now, how can we go beyond medicine? Well, if we go back to Thea, I'm gonna open one more file. Now here, I really tried to give Thea a hard time. I know, it wasn't very nice of me, but I wanted to see the limits. I tried to pick a sport that would really give uh, some problems because usually when we do these, this tracking, we tell our patients and subjects to wear form-fitting clothes so that we can put the markers either on the skin or on something that doesn't move. Snowboarding, totally different. You can see here, I have my helmet on and I'm wearing snowboarding pants. I have boots on. I have a board strapped to my feet. And still, the results are actually quite good. It does a great job tracking. You can see here we have our 3D model of me pretending like I'm on a slope. And of course, occasionally you just have to jump. So the applications of markerless motion capture are huge. So many opportunities out there. And this technology didn't exist when I got into biomechanics, but for all you new researchers coming up through high school and college, 
there is so much potential out there for what you could do. Just think uh, of what you can apply markerless technology to, uh, from sports to uh, medical research. Think uh, we could even maybe even take them underwater, look at scuba divers. I mean, maybe this is a long way into the future, but the technology that is currently being developed is phenomenal and we can do so much with it. So we are very excited to see where things are going. And since this is National Biomechanics Day, it's really for uh, high school students, we just wanted to encourage you to look into maybe looking at biomechanics as your future. And thank you for joining us on this. Now, we're gonna stick around and answer some questions. And yes, we know that uh, Sometimes you get uh, a little shy asking questions. We had some good questions from our first session. So I'll go ahead and answer some of those while you think up the questions that you might want to ask. So one of the questions was, what about animals? It's interesting, and you heard Paul DeVita talk about animal biomechanics, can you do markerless motion capture on animals? The answer is uh, yes and no. Yes, it is technically possible, but for humans, we now have these 500,000 uh, and counting images that allow us to get more and more reliable data. For animals, it depends on the animal and we have to start collecting those images and processing them. So one day it could be possible on just about any animal. Currently, it's a little bit more of a challenge. And the other question that was very interesting is what about if somebody is wearing a cube? So they have this giant cube on them can it track them? Well, the person has to at least kind of look like a human. We've done tests with bulky clothes and even with the helmet, as long as it looks kind of like a human, it can track. But if we're changing it too much, it's going to give it some trouble. So we have a good question here. What professions can biomechanics be used on? Uh, the limits to that are There are a lot of options out there as far as where biomechanics can be used. Uh, one of the guys I went to college with, or was actually in grad school, he went on to analyze gait as a way to identify people and uh, got some contracts with the Department of Defense. So using gait in the same way we use fingerprints. I don't know exactly what happened. I've always wondered. Uh, exactly where that ended up, but that is kind of an obscure way. Uh, space research, I know that uh, there's been a lot of biomechanics done for NASA, and I have personally uh, been involved in stroke research and orthopedics, uh, working with uh, clinics, and I've helped put labs together for Parkinson's, so a lot of medical uh, options. In sports, there's obviously a lot going on. Baseball is probably the most exciting sport for biomechanics right now, as the biomechanics of pitching has created some incredible breakthroughs. And there's uh, also for uh, industrial work or like in grocery stores, repetitive actions can result in injuries. So the biomechanics of that have resulted in some different design. For example, I've talked to a, a chain of grocery stores who wanted to change their uh, system for cashiers to check out because 
they were noticing that there were injuries, so they wanted to address the issue so that they would have less injuries in the workplace because of it. So there are a lot of options, and I think it's going to continue growing as biomechanics, even though it has technically been around even for centuries, only probably in the last 20, 30 years has it sped up so much that we have gotten uh, to where we are now. And we can keep going forwards. And the other, well, okay. Uh, you can always, uh, we're probably gonna leave this video up. So you can ask the questions right down below and we'll go ahead and answer them. So don't be shy. We are happy to help anybody learn more about biomechanics and markerless motion capture. Uh, that's a pretty exciting thing we've been working on, but not only, uh, honestly, we love biomechanics. So thanks for being part of this.